But without further ado, I would like to introduce Josh Rose. He's the Vice President, IQVIA R&D Solutions Strategy and Global Head at IQVIA Virtual Trials. Josh, over to you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, potentially good evening to everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Um, and I think without further ado, um, as we pull up uh, the keynote slides for this, uh, Louis, I certainly hope um, it's great that we created this opportunity for us to engage uh, virtually, and it'd be excellent if we can also do it in person um, at some point um, uh, later on. If, uh, yeah, let's go up to the front and I'll kick off. So, as I said, welcome to everyone. My name is Josh Rose, and I am uh, Vice President of, uh, of IQVIA's Decentralized or Clinical Trial Business. If we go to the next slide. Um, we're, we're certainly at, uh, if you can advance to the next slide. Thank you. We're certainly at uh, interesting times. And, uh, you know, for, for many of us uh, experiencing the last uh, three to four months, so certainly you know, these are, are times of crisis or times of challenging. And I was uh, extremely inspired by, uh, by this quote from uh, the 35th president of the United States that basically uh, commented on the fact that when you look at the Chinese character for, uh, for crisis, it really represents two sides of a coin, both danger uh, and opportunity. And so as, uh, you know, as we think about the times that we're in, so this is definitely um, a time to address the crisis, address the danger, as I think we're all doing very effectively in our roles and the critical role that we play in healthcare and in pharma. But also this does represent an opportunity, an unprecedented opportunity to, to really um, to advance and uh, both innovations and advance how we think about um, how we think about clinical research in general. So I'll talk about that for a little bit and then I'm gonna, when I'm done, I have some esteemed colleagues uh, who are all experts in clinical innovation and digital innovation that will be joining me for a panel. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. When we think about the times that we're in, clearly there's some titanic shifts that are in play. And the question for all of us, and one thing that I'll emphasize as uh, over the next 20 minutes, but also um, during our panel discussion is how do we how do we ensure that some of the adoption of innovations that we're seeing, especially around uh, patient centricity, how do we ensure that those actually stick and last? And I want to share a couple of examples of these titanic shifts that did happen previously and the lasting impact that they have, and maybe food for thought for us for how do we think about the time that we're in right now and some of these uh, elements, how do they stick and change and really have long-term implications on clinical research? So let, let's go back to the beginning of World War II, early 1940s, obviously the world was in chaos, titanic shifts are in play. And uh, pre-World War II, the number of women in the workforce was around 35%. Uh, you know, it was just a kind of a different environment that we're in. But then, um, you know, the world, uh, men in particular, um, entered uh, the, the, the battlefields and created an unprecedented opportunity for women to enter the workforce. Some of you may remember the, uh, you know, the arsenal of democracy and the step up that the U.S. made in terms of bringing women into the workforce to help build planes and uh, tanks and, uh, and other things that were needed in order to support um, the war. But the impact of that was remarkable that the number of women that entered the workforce by the end of World War II was increased by 50%, which was remarkable. Now, the nice thing and the important thing is that stuck, that lasted. And, and today, you know, women represent, uh, you know, obviously women representation as it should be in the workforce is, is equal. Um, interesting statistic, women in the US represent 50% of participants in college, which is, which is uh, as it should be and it's excellent. So, titanic shift and stuck. Let's go to another example. Another one that's interesting when we think about, it, if you go to the next slide, is the events of 9-11. Of so clearly, a uh, remarkable period um, in the US, but in the world in general, September 11, you may all remember, uh, the, the incidents at the World Trade Center. And as a result of that, the U.S. and other countries instituted safety measures in airports. Uh, in the U.S., we refer to that as TSA. 
but uh, that safety effort was stood up. And today, you know, multiple years later, it's still there and it's stuck and it remains. So those are titanic shifts that remained. Let's go to the next slide. So we're clearly in, in a similar environment right now. In December uh, of last year, the world was introduced to the coronavirus. Um, uh, governments, countries across uh, the globe instituted um, stay-at-home measures, quarantining, and other measures, social distancing to keep us safe. And, uh, and many of those are still in place today. An example is this call as well. So the question for us is, if we think about those examples of titanic shift and what we're going through right now, if we go to the next slide, the real question is, as, we're, as we'll talk about today, some of the innovations and changes that we've made to clinical research, in particular around patient centricity and innovation and digitization and bringing those more forcefully into the clinical uh, development environment in order to allow us to to sustain clinical research. The question is, are those gonna stick? So things like home health nursing, telemedicine, connected devices, et cetera. So I think that's an interesting question that I would like for all of us as we spend the, you know, the, this session and, and, and the next uh, a couple of hours today uh, to think about. So clearly our industry needs that to embrace that innovation and that agility in order uh, to respond to the environment that we're in today, but certainly to carry it forward. And let's go to the next slide. So the good news is that, uh, and I am certain that, that all of you uh, here on this call right now have experienced this in one way or another. The good news is, is that the industry by and large has really embraced the times that we're in and, and really adopted a, a agility and uh, innovation and a flexible mindset in order to ensure that clinical research, which is so important at the end in order to bring needed drugs to market, uh, was maintained in one way or another. And companies uh, adjusted to it in different ways. Um, if you look at the, at the pie chart um, on the right, on the left-hand side, companies took different me measures. Some stopped new studies, some stopped new studies and uh, enrollment in existing studies. Some attempted to maintain existing studies by leveraging innovative technologies. And companies did it in different ways. And I'm sure that for all of you on the call, you know, pharma experts, uh, pharma executives, I'm sure that in your individual ways, you, um, you adopted those as well. And one of the things that was really interesting at this time is not only did we see it across the industry, across pharma companies, and some examples from the public domain are there in front of us from Biogen, from Janssen, from Novo, et cetera. But what's, what's really encouraging is the, um, is the embracement of innovation that we saw across the globe from regulators, certainly from the FDA, EMA, MHRA, and across the globe was really this notion of the importance of maintaining studies and a shift towards patient centricity and accelerating some of the thinking to allow some innovations that we'll talk about today to really to use them um, at an accelerated fashion so that uh, we can continue clinical research. I'll share with you one example. If we go to the next slide from some of the activity that IQVIA is doing. And this is just one of many examples um, of things that we've done of taking some of the um, innovative approaches in order to ensure that studies are continuing. So this was a very complex study, uh, idiopathic pulmonary um, uh, fibrosis, very complex patient uh, situation. Uh, challenging patient environment. And, and there was real strong desire, of course, from the sponsor and from Akiva to ensure that th this uh, study uh, continued. We didn't want the study to stop. We didn't want patients to, uh, to drop out of the study and to try to maintain as much as possible the momentum of, of the study. So with the sponsor and with regulators across the globe, we looked at the study and we started implementing some of these elements that allowed the study to continue. So in this case, we looked at the protocol and we determined that there were some assessments that were potentially important, but maybe not absolutely critical for the endpoint. So we relaxed those. 
we looked at uh, ECOA and the e-diary that heretofore was really done on site. And we quickly switched that and converted that to an electronic one so the patient can continue participating. We implemented things like direct-to-patient drug delivery from the site to the patient's home and also implemented home health nursing or home research nursing so that activities, visits that needed physical intervention and needed the healthcare prof professional to interact with the patient um, continued. And we did those, of course, working in unison with regulators across the globe. This was a global study. And the study continued um, with, with great success, uh, not a single patient dropout. Um, and that's an Acuvian example, but I know that for everybody on the phone, there's multiple examples of successes that you have experienced yourself as well. And most importantly, this is a sign of the, this, this innovative mindset and some of the um, activities that, uh, that uh, have came about in an accelerated fashion because of the environment we're in. So let's go to the next slide and think about a little bit of where we are today and what does it mean for the future. So think about pre-COVID and post-COVID and this opportunity that we have in front of us. So, so pre-COVID, protocols in general had a tendency to be complex. Uh, you're all familiar with the Tufts research that shows that over the last several years, the number of, uh, of elements in a, in a protocol have, have increased hundreds of percentage points. So post-COVID, should we think about protocol simplification? How to make it more patient-centric and more simple to execute? Primary, pre-COVID, primarily on-site operations, whether it's monitoring, source data verification, et cetera. Post-COVID, can we move those to be more remote? Can we do site selections remotely? In countries that do allow source data verification, can we do those remotely? So when it comes to the actual model of executing research, pre-COVID, typically more traditional randomized trial approach, post-COVID, can we think about things like novel trial designs, greater use of real, real world and uh, synthetic arm comparators, and of course, an area that's near and dear to my and to, my, to our panel's heart is virtual trials and, and hybrid studies and shifting some of those activities to the patient's home. So we're, we, there's this unprecedented time that we're in right now where we look at the pre-COVID way of conducting clinical research that was very more, more rigid, more site-based, um, you know, more complex. And do we have an opportunity to think about post-COVID as, as a way to start not only for COVID response, but thereafter as shifting towards a more patient-centric and simple uh, way that delivers the same critical endpoints in, in drugs, but does it in a way that's more efficient and more patient-centric. Let's move to the next slide. So one of the interesting things is that the, uh, while COVID has certainly had substantial impact in the way that we think about innovation, and how we think about uh, embracing technologies in order to adjust to the times we're in. The, the important news is uh, companies have started thinking about well before that, and, and my colleagues on the panel will share some of their experiences pre and during COVID. Um, clearly, you know, a remarkable uh, remote study initiated by Pfizer back in 2011 that really kicked off um, how we're thinking about uh, virtual or decentralized trials. And then we, we went through this journey for those on the call and they recognize that this is of course the Gartner hype curve um, uh, where there was tremendous excitement after that initial study waiting for the results. But then, you know, what we found is maybe some of the technologies and how we were thinking about virtual trials were maybe a little bit before our time. Um, but that being said, uh, you know, over the last two or three years, we have seen and we've been experienced uh, tremendous interest in virtual trials and decentralized trials, primarily for the reasons that we just talked about, patient centricity, driving simplicity, reducing complexity, and really bringing about better clinical trial results. Now, the interesting thing is the dark line on this slide is one that I've used pre-COVID and had a personal assessment and views on the extent of new studies that would incorporate elements of virtual trials. Um, COVID has certainly had, a, had an impact. And the question is, for all of us, has that raised that inflection point um, beyond what it was before and will it stick? So let's go to the next slide. And towards the end of the finish here, we certainly need to think about how it is that we allow some of these elements for patients in particular to stick. If we go to the next slide. 
First and foremost, it's important to keep the patient in the center and surround the patient with technology, support systems, global infrastructure, and, and, and of course, um, you know, use of, uh, of local uh, professionals. This is the Akivia model. This is how Akivia thinks about uh, decentralized trials, patient in the middle, um, virtual support centers, what we refer to as a virtual SMO, taking advantage of local practitioners, whether it's physicians in countries where it makes sense, phlebotomist, home care nursing, and of course, significant embracement of technology, connected devices for biometrics, for endpoints, and you name it. If we go to the next slide, I mean, the good news is when we think about decentralized trials, it's not black and white. And, and I'm hopeful and certain that many of you have, have heard now about how we think about hybrid studies. And in particular, hybrid studies is how we take elements of virtual trials and apply them to some of the visits. Some of them are at the site, some of them are at home. Our experience is, it has been this, that every study has an opportunity to incorporate patient-centric innovations. And the question is looking at the protocol to what extent. We're seeing a tremendous amount of interest right now in companies thinking about new protocols, existing protocols, and how can they be modified to insert elements of, of decentralized or virtual trials, moving as many activities as possible to the patient's location using elements as you see over there on the right-hand side. And it's, a, it, it's an important exercise for us to go through because, um, we know from research that uh, less than 5% of eligible patients participate in clinical research, but when asked, more than 60 to 65 of them want to. And we believe that part of the reason why they're not participating more is we're just not making it easy enough for them to do it. So by enabling some of these great technologies and moving activities to the patient's home, we can do that. Next slide, please. So it's important to have technology and the global infrastructure to support it. This is Acuvia's uh, um, orchestrated, um, enabled, and integrated platform called Study Hub that incorporates things like e-consent, telemedicine, connected devices, but also support infrastructure on a global basis, 24-7 um, tech support, ab ability to provision devices on a global basis, and also multilingual. Okay, so in closing, before we move to our panel, food for thought for all of us to think about. If you don't mind going to the next slide. So the question is, what is really gonna stick? Um, and and how, what role do we all play in the industry in order to help? So um, adaptable hybrid clinical models, we believe that those are gonna click. A move towards fewer um, in, um, uh, fewer in clinic um, visits and moving more towards this blend of offsite and telemedicine greater flexibility in incorporating patient centricity into studies. We're already seeing a great increased use of connected devices for vitals, for endpoints, et cetera. And as I mentioned, greater use of home health nursing or phlebotomists or other healthcare practitioners across the globe um, in order to, um, to allow studies to be conducted at home. The question from the industry is how can we help? So some areas for us to think about. A, to continue pushing for and improving patient centricity in your models and in your protocols. Uh, evolve how we think about a site. So heretofore, a site was a hospital or a clinic, but can moving forward, can it be a patient home? Can it be a community center? Can it be a pharmacy? Uh, we're seeing with COVID certainly some very innovative ways of rethinking about how we engage with the patient, bring them into the study, screen them, vaccinate them, baseline them, and allow them to continue participating from their home. I mentioned that the regulators played an important critical role in terms of helping to de uh, incorporate decentralized trials. Um, I I'm encouraged to hear that they are gonna continue thinking about that and some of those measures that have been put in place are gonna maintain. And of course, thinking about patient centricity. So that's a good start for this panel. And now what I'd like to do is quickly introduce my panelists. If we can go to the next slide, that would be terrific. Okay, so I am really honored here today um, to be, uh, um, to be on, on this panel with some esteemed colleagues. And let me just go and introduce them and then um, I will, um, uh, we'll kick it off. So first let's start uh, with Dr. Rodrigo Garcia. 
Uh, Rodrigo is head of clinical innovation at EMD Serono. In his role, Rodrigo and his group are responsible for transforming clinical trials, operations, introducing innovative digital and data-enabled solutions um, to study teams with, obviously, patient centricity in mind. Rodrigo is a, a physician, and uh, he's been in clinical operations uh, and in pharma for 16 years. Um, Rodrigo, thank you for joining us today. Um, my next guest is Kai uh, Lengel. Um, Kai is really is a pioneer in patient-centric uh, or patient-facing uh, solutions. Uh, he's been working with innovative technologies since 2000. Um, he is a founder in 2012 of eClinical Health, which developed the the clinical the ClinPal remote uh, clinical platform. Um, he today he's with Jensen, where he leads digital healthcare innovation. He's also uh, one of the key members um, in the industry-led uh, IMI initiative related to decentralized trials, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that. Kai, thank you for joining us. And last but not least is uh, is uh, my colleague Angela Walker. Um, Angela Walker is from Lilly. She began her career as a research scientist in molecular biology. Um, she loves experimental design, which ultimately led her to carve a unique career path by focusing on disruptive innovation. She spent over 18 years in the pharma industry supporting modernization and innovation initiatives and improving the patient and site experience. And she's a great expert and really excited to have her on the panel. So thank you for joining us today. Um, if we can go to, uh, if we can close the slides and go to uh, a shared view. Hey, everyone. Thank you. Well, thank you, Josh. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Well, let, let's lead off over here. And uh, so, Rodrigo, I'll start with you. Um, so, how were you running innovation in clinical trials before COVID? And then with that in mind, what aspects of, of uh, our, our have worked well and, and where do you think that you, there are areas for improvement from your experience pre-COVID? Mm -hmm. Sure, Josh, absolutely. Thanks for the question and thank you to you and Proventa for inviting me to this. And it's a pleasure obviously to be with such a good peers about innovation. Um, so before COVID, right, and, and Josh, you and I, we've been working before COVID, right? So we were already doing decentralized trials in some way or form, applying some of these components um, as, as it made sense for each specific study. How then COVID came and, or before I go there, as, just to step back, so as an innovator, right, I'm sure my peers and you have been through this, which it's always, you always have to do some research and then some marketing, if you will, with study teams, because innovations, they impose risks, they impose costs, and challenges, right? So that's what we were doing. Um, sometimes it was a positive outcome. Sometimes study teams will push back and it's okay. Um, and then with COVID-19, definitely I would say it has accelerated things. I wouldn't say it has changed how we do things because we were already doing that, but definitely now people will open the door in a more easy way, right? And they will be like, oh yeah, now I want you to come over here and let's talk about the study because my patients, they cannot go to the sites. Forget about the sites, the sites are closed and the patients, they need to get the study drug. So I remember sometimes we use as an exception to send a study drug to the patient's home. Can we do that more often now? So for me, COVID-19 helped us to really accelerate a lot of decentralized capabilities that we were pushing, but we were getting some resistance, rightfully so, because at the same time, as you mentioned it in your presentation, the regulatory agencies, they were open, but they were not that um, proactive in this decentralized approach. And again, with COVID-19, regulatory agencies were just like, now you can do this. Okay, we're gonna be open. Make sure you document this very well. And as long as you're not impacting the safety of the patients, Pharma, go ahead, do it. So for, for me, and I think the study teams, and I'm sure for my peers and for you, it has been an, an, a push that we so much wanted. Um, and it has happened obviously in this unfortunate crisis, but it has helped us to accelerate, learn, 
um, and iterate, right? And try to make things better in small steps, because as you said, it's not one size fits all. So, so that's where we are, very exciting. And I think now study teams are extremely open to have a deeper conversation with us. Back to you. Oh, excellent, excellent. Thanks for that. So with that in mind, maybe I'll build off of that. So I know that you've been um, active in this space with you, Rodrigo, and your team. But Kai, switching to you for a second, when we think about activities that preceded COVID, um, you've been a pretty influential member of the IMI Trials at Home um, initiative. And maybe the question for you is, if you can share with us a little bit in the interest of time about the IMI activity and what we're doing there, but most importantly, how do you see a shift in COVID, post-COVID and how IMI is thinking and, and how does it change uh, the, the trajectory for that project? Yeah, thanks, uh, good, good question. So, so Trials at Home is, uh, is a five year project and uh, it's, it's a big um, initiative with 30 plus organizations um, and about 40 million um, uh, funding. So it's really transformative, large initiative, uh, quite a large ship, um, 200 people involved and all of that. It doesn't turn that quickly. So uh, COVID of course came as a surprise to, uh, to everybody and uh, before COVID the focus was very much on, on some of the kind of what today I feel like the basics, uh, remote e-consent, direct patient shipments, telemedicine, and all of those things that were difficult six months ago, uh, but today are kind of routine practice. Um, that was very much the focus. Um, now what we're doing is to try to understand how has the landscape changed. And, and uh, Josh, I took a screenshot of some of your metrics that you presented earlier about what action is the industry taking. And that's part of the data capture uh, uh, process we are doing. So we are surveying some of our member companies um, uh, to understand what, what kind of things are uh, put in place and all of that. And how should we shift our, our focus to make sure that we have a project that will be relevant in four or five years time by the time that we are finished. They would look a bit silly now if they would come up with some recommendations about telemedicine <laughs> and spend five years doing that. So we need to be mindful of, of that. But we want to be mindful, uh, make a mindful choice, understand the landscape, and then, then make the right choices. But there's a lot of brainstorming um, happening. And myself, I often find myself at the leading edge of kind of pioneering ideation. So I'm lucky in the way that I have ideas in my back pocket that we're not the right fit for um, you know, the, the environment six months ago, but now the, the world is quite open to new ideas and trying to define the next frontier for, for innovation in this space, uh, going beyond you know, the telemedicine, all of those, those basic building blocks. Um, so some of these ideas are being put, put forward into brainstorming and see how we could move this into implementation. Um, so that's, that's how um, um, we are tackling it. Um, we have a bit of time to think about it and, uh, you know, gather the data that we need and uh, then, then do the, make the right decisions. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what's happening uh, with Charles at Home. That's great, Kai. And, and I'm quite familiar with the, with the project and it's an ambitious and important project. And it's interesting what you share is that uh, it's pan-European, it's multi-pharma and obviously moves at the pace of that because of it. And it's interesting to see how has COVID, uh, is COVID gonna provide uh, wind for the sales of IMI, or is it actually going to, uh, uh, is IMI find itself in a catch-up mode, um, you know, with all the adoption of innovation? So that's going to be um, really it's interesting. It's going to be both. I mean, now the product is more relevant than ever, but we also have to up our game in terms of ideation and all of all of that. So it's it's going to do both, I think. Excellent. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, Angela, uh, just a question for you. Um, I'll, I'll ask one question and I think I'm going to riff off of, a, off of something that Rodrigo got me thinking about, but let's start with this. What aspects of remote patient-centric research do you expect to continue across the industry after the pandemic? Yeah, thank you for the question, Josh. Uh, you know, I think the one thing that we can take away from the uh, COVID um, pandemic is that people have become true believers in the power of patient centricity in applying technology to make it more possible to bring trials directly to the patient. So with that, I think we're seeing um, a lot of people are much more comfortable with using telemedicine, um, electronic devices, 
tablets and just generally allowing nurses to come into the patient's home and, and, and take care of patients more locally where they are. Um, I do expect fully to see these things stick. Um, we know that teams have um, started coming directly to our innovation group and asking, you know, how can I get telemedicine in my trial? How can I have e-consent in my trial? Do we have any devices that can go in that virtual doctor's bag for nurses to carry along to make things much easier for them to, to travel and for us to ship supplies out to them and to their various localities? So I think that the, the floodgates are open. And now that gives us um, that, that same uh, thing that you were just mentioning is like, now that the floodgates are open, I think we have more opportunity than ever before to keep pushing ahead and, and striving for new frontiers. Um, that uh, we have a concept that we call that digital doctor's bag. And I think that that will probably be the next thing that becomes far more robust as we think about the need to have more compact and mobile ready technology that can be deployed whether it's sending things to a patient's home that they can do to self-quantify or adding those um, items into a, a kit that goes out to your mobile nurse or your mobile healthcare provider to help them facilitate those in-home or those in-office or in-school dormitory visits that will just further our opportunities to, to keep moving this patient-centric um, efforts forward. Uh, that, that certainly makes sense. And, and it'd be interesting to see how that digital... Uh, the digital um, doctor bag is, is a really good analogy, is especially if we start thinking about adoption of, of new capabilities. I think it's a good metaphor um, for how do we think about it. But sticking with you for a second. So Rodrigo um, got me thinking about this notion of internal resistance to innovation. And, and, uh, and I would say that uh, from my experience working with many of you and with many sponsors across the industry, internal resistance Securing executive sponsorship for innovation is was certainly an aspect that needs to be dealt with, especially the larger the company becomes, right? So my question, um, Angela, from your perspective is, do you sense that, uh, like you mentioned, this floodgate being open, do you sense that this acceleration of openness towards innovation at Lilly, as an example, that maybe at others, is that, is that are we seeing a, a step change? I do think so. I think people are realizing how much we need to future-proof our protocols and provide that um, basis to allow us to be more agile. Um, the, you know, the heavy lift that teams had to go through to adapt and, and deal with this first wave of the pandemic, uh, I think folks are just thinking about you know, what happens if there's a second wave, um, what happens if there's another viral outbreak that, of a different sort in the future, and, and what can I do today? as I'm thinking about my new protocol development that will give me flexibility to handle any kind of scenario, whether it's just challenges we normally have had in, in mobility of patients and distance to uh, getting folks uh, into uh, brick and mortar sites. The teams have it in their forefront of their minds right now. And I think senior leaders have it in the forefront of their minds right now. And I think they have a better idea of what to expect and what to understand. And the reality of what we're dealing with in this very moment has crystallized that concept um, to say, you know, this is the new normal and we should act that way. And, and I do see more teams, um, you know, being much more willing to have those conversations. And I hear, um, I hear the, the, the conversations in the hallways, the virtual hallways, um, more and more. It's just on the tip of everybody's tongue and it's everywhere you go. So it's as an innovator who struggled for the first, you know, several years of being the uh, on the ideation end of this project, it's such a wonderful thing to to hear, you know, things that were part of your core group, just be part of the vernacular of every study team um, as they have embraced that um, ideology. So it's a wonderful thing to see, and it's a very exciting time. Yeah, there's some some really interesting points that you made, and I see that Kai and Rodrigo, are, and I'm certainly na uh, nodding of this notion of, you know, the the innovators within pharma you know, somewhat on the side. And now you feel that, uh, you know, some of the things that we've talked about are becoming more mainstream, which is really good. And I'd like to come back to future proof and new normal in a second. But, but Kai, maybe on this, on this notion of you, you've been looking at technology and looking at innovation for, for quite some time now, and have been a pioneer in, uh, on your own introducing some of these. So what do you think, or what do you think 
what are you seeing? What is the industry seeing? What have we learned in terms of gaps that exist today in the technology and how we think about uh, decentralized clinical trials? And what does the industry need to do better in the future? Well, uh, there's a saying that when the tide goes out, you'll see who's not wearing a swimsuit. And uh, I think this, this time around, uh, pretty much everybody was caught with their pants down. And uh, I think that is the one big learning uh, from, from this, not just in our industry, but elsewhere as well, is that we don't want to be caught uh, like that again. So uh, I think this resiliency will be built into our plans in the future. Um, so that's maybe the one, one big thing is now, I, I guarantee that right now, every single study team is thinking about that. Uh, how do I deal with this right now? How do I deal with this in my next study uh, to make sure that I at least have a plan if something like this comes around? And, and that kind of creates the pull for these, these new ideas. And, and maybe the challenge now is to, because what, what we have to do as, a, as innovators is to go from tinkering with innovation to massive scale up instantly. <laughs> Normally, there's a bit, a bit more of a runaway to do that. And now it's like, well, we need this up and running next week. <laughs> so, um, um, so hopefully that will also uh, help companies uh, with the scale up adoption and all of that. And the other big ch ch things that I think will change, not just with the industry, but all, with all of the stakeholders around us, regulators, patients, sites, um, CROs like IQV, I'm sure you've seen a big uptick in, in, in interest in, in these kind of services. Everybody is now more ready to do business virtually. Everybody's more ready to connect uh, online like we are doing this, this now. Uh, sites are going to be very uh, receptive to these kind of solutions because that allows them to stay in business rather than being closed down. Um, so not only is pharma going to be more ready, but the ecosystem uh, is going to be more ready for, for all of these things. Um, so, um, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of good things that will come out of you know, this really, really bad situation. Um, so I think once the dust settles, we'll, we'll see through the dust and, and see kind of what, what's there. But I think we'll find the new normal being much more receptive to, um, to these innovative ideas that um, we, we don't have to push so hard anymore, but there will be strong pull. Um, so in, in a way, we, we are kind of in a lucky position uh, as innovators because we have a lot of these solutions in, in our toolkits uh, that are now going to be um, scaled up and adopted. So. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's excellent. And in particular, excellent for that wonderful analogy that I'm sure is going to stay with all of us on the tide uh, going out and who is prepared and who is not based on their beach attire. That's great. I love that one. And it's definitely useful. Um, but with that in mind, maybe Rodrigo to you. So, um, you know, Kai talked about preparedness. I, I liked um, Angela's comment about future proofing. Um, and, and, and I actually think it's a great point, uh, certainly when it comes to potential wave two of COVID or long-term uh, lasting, we just do not know. We don't know yet, but future-proofing is not a bad thing to apply in general, right? So my question for you is, what do you think, um, what, what will you, uh, your organization or in general be doing differently post-COVID with regard to future-proofing or, or anything? Sure, thanks, Jeff. So I think, so I would say um, flexibility, my biggest concern is that people want to go back to normal, right? I mean, I think this has proven that that normal was not working well. And obviously in the context of patients in clinical trials, and you had it on your slide, clinical trials were getting and are getting more and more complex for the right reasons probably, right? We, it's right. hard to have a study. And once it's very expensive and once that you want to enroll patients, you want to gather as much information as possible. But let's be honest, there is a lot of research out there showing that we only use a portion of the data that we collect from patients. The same for sample size, et cetera. So we should not go, we should not go back to that. So what I want is we used to, uh, as innovators, we needed to get a couple of easy wins to gain trust and then to try the next step. And I think with the situation, as Kai mentioned, we used to push, now we're being pulled by the study teams, by the physicians within the companies, et cetera, great. What we need to make sure that remains is flexibility in our studies, simplicity in our studies, right? We have to try to match our current situation. If you, cannot, if you can only work from home, the clinical trials, they need to allow that. 
they need to, for patients to say, you can come to the clinic or we can send you a study drug. You can pick up your, you can take your own car or you can call this company or you can use an app and someone will pick you up, etc. So from my perspective, flexibility in how we design our studies and how study teams can leverage DCT capabilities has to be the new norm. And very important, as Angela and Kai mentioned, this is scale up now. This is the opportunity not to think about, let's just talk about that study that is coming in 2021. It's like, let's talk about your program and how are we going to implement this in your program? So hopefully that's what I, what I want to see and, and that's what we will continue uh, after the pandemic in pre preparing us for the next wave or the next pandemic. Gotcha. Thank you for that. So, you know, when we think about innovation and in, in adopting, one of the things that I hear, and I'm sure that you all hear it as well, is uh, beyond just internal uh, resistance or internal fears, there's always the external element of the regulatory environment. And, um, and there's some unbelievable initiatives underway right now. Kai talked about IMI, this pan-European that has a very strong um, regulatory uh, connection to it in the US, the, the city initiative, clinical trial um, innovation initiative, um, clearly funded by the FDA along with Duke and with many members, possibly folks on this call that are really aiming to bridge and pull uh, the regulatory environment closer into it. So Kai, my question for you is from your experience in particular in Europe, um, to what extent do you think that we will see a mind shift towards uh, Rodrigo's comment about are things going to regress back towards the mean? Do you think that some of the openness that we've seen from regulators in Europe in particular are going to last? Uh, I, I think a lot of it will, will last. Um, so this is now, a, I think, a massive global experiment in, in how will this all, all work out. And now we are going to get great data to show uh, is there any difference to do some of these assessments remotely versus face-to-face, -face, paper versus electronic? And, and people have been afraid to do these experiments in the past. And now everybody was forced to jump into it uh, and, and we'll get some really great data coming out of this. And the data will tell, tell a certain story. And I think depending on what that, that story ends up being, uh, we'll, we'll determine um, some of those future recommendations. But there's going to be a ton of data coming out of this, this great, well, strange experiment, let's call it that way. Um, so I'm looking forward to see what can we learn from this, this data and how we can use that to, uh, to build a strong case for some of these to, to continue. Uh, there probably will be many uh, lessons learned as well, things that could have been done better because this was kind of emergency measure, measures put in place, certainly not optimized. Uh, but I hope that the, the overarching team will be uh, positive um, and that there will be some cool things that should remain that will be backed up by evidence um, and then when you have evidence that, you know, is, is black and white, then it's, it's very hard to argue against that. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing that evidence and then uh, hopefully that will guide with, with our policies and practices going, going forward. I don't think we should go blindly into this. Uh, I think that we can learn a lot from this and then um, optimize these things that we now um, have been put into the field. And then that will lead to a better new normal than, than what we had in the past. Excellent. So I'm, I'm going to remind uh, the audience that the uh, Q&A um, panel is open and there's a couple questions over here. I'll take one of them and then I'll go back to come of my question. So here's a question that came in and it, uh, the question is as follows. Is direct to patient telemedicine, um, Internet of Things, in clinical trials and other uh, elements, are these outcomes of COVID or is COVID just acting as an accelerator? So I know that we talked about this a little bit, but I'm going to open up to um, wh whoever wants to jump in and take this one. So is COVID, uh, is it an accelerator or is this an outcome of what we've seen? I will go for the second one, Josh. I think it's an accelerator, right? Because all of us, and but else, because just on, on, on my behalf, we were doing this, but we were not getting that much traction sometimes with study teams. For others, we were. And I think it has accelerated things, right? So I, yesterday, I got an email from someone within my company saying, hey, there is this forum where I would never, innovation would never be invited to that forum. And said, they're asking you to come and ask us what, how can they help to accelerate 
your top priorities. That would have never happened. So uh, I think we're, it's, it's more acceleration, right? And, and also because people, as Angela mentioned it, now they are very open and they are saying, my study, let's be honest, is not ready to be performed at, at home, right? So I'm not saying they are gonna switch everything because that doesn't make uh, any sense, particularly if you're talking about oncology, for example, but there can always, there are always room for improvement. And now they're flexible saying, well, maybe of those 15 visits, maybe not all of them are necessary, or maybe not all of them, the patient actually needs to go to the home. What about if we send a study nurse? Okay, let's have that conversation. So I think it's more an acceleration from my perspective, or that's what I've been experiencing so far in these four months. Hi, right, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would uh, agree with that 100%. Um, and none of the ideas and things that are in the field right now are really very new ideas. I mean, they have been around for a long time. They are in routine use in, in care delivery, for example. Telemedicine is broadly used um, to deliver healthcare to, to patients. Uh, uh, we just haven't adopted those, those things. So the ideas are not really new. What has happened with COVID is that it has accelerated the adoption of the ideas that were there already and solutions uh, and has really shifted the innovation horizon the good news for the innovators is that we are also not out of business because this horizon has simply shifted. There are new things coming in the horizon. We need to shift our gaze and focus into the new horizon um, that was you know, dramatically shifted. And there are new things to look forward to and all of, all of that stuff. But I would agree it's an accelerator um, uh, for things that already were available. Gotcha. Maybe I'll, I'll take another question over here that's, that's coming in and I encourage others to continue. Um, sending um let, let's start with this one uh angela it's a little bit it's a little bit back to the same topic that uh, i shared with you question i asked you earlier and maybe i'm picking on you in particular just because i'm a little bit familiar with your organization and from talking to you but uh, what are what are some of the suggestions that you have of breaking down uh, the resistance to innovation and, and maybe to complicate the question a little bit tie it into how do we ensure that there isn't going to be a regression towards uh, the previous normal? Right. Yeah. It's a great question. Like how do you get people off the dime as an innovator and how do you, uh, you get, get that first foot in the door? A, a little bit of it is I, I think just complete persistence and, and trying to, to find where, where that sweet spot is for a given team. Uh, I think that hybrid virtual trials are the thing that are most implementable, um, but then you can grab elements of things that are far more futuristic and set up pilots. And one thing that I like to um, I like to to say to my study teams a lot is that you know every everything that we do that's new in your trial is an opportunity to just advance our efforts into the future. There's no wrong way of doing something. It's just ways, some ways work better than others. And every opportunity is just a chance to learn and, and to innovate. And so we take a real emergent strategy mindset in the work that we do. And I, I do like to say, you know, every clinical trial is an experiment and every operational model you apply to that trial is also an experiment. And we're either going to learn what to do or what not to do. Um, and I think that sort of that kind of lowers the tension in the room a little bit. So, you know, we don't have like a fear of, oh, this failed. Uh, I think that's a very hot button sort of thing for teams to get into that mindset. But if you just say, you know, we're learning as we go, we're building the plane as we fly it, and we're going to learn something new that we can take into the rest of your program. And that usually um, gives people lots of ideas to generate and riff off of uh, that can think about, you know, well, in this trial, we'll try this, and then we'll take it to the next level in the second trial, and then we'll really shoot the moon in the third trial. And that's, that's just a wonderful thing to see being embraced um, all over the company. You know, you bring up a really interesting point about this notion of things may fail and having an openness towards accepting it. So I'll share that I was talking yesterday to a colleague at a large pharma where we're conducting a virtual trial for COVID for 50,000 patients on a global basis. It's a, it's a massive undertaking. The complexity and the timelines are, are breaknaking. They're so fast. And we were, we were, so this is a colleague on the technology side in pharma, we were talking about the fact that we need to be open to the fact that some stuff is not gonna work. Mm -hmm. and, and, but, you know, we, we're, we're, we're an industry of innovators uh, for, for hundreds of years and we'll figure out how to make it work. So I, I wonder if that's kind of what you were going to, Angelo, and that's part mm -hmm. of the, 
mindset that we have to have. Rodrigo, I see you're nodding. Do you want to weigh in yeah. on that? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say something that has helped me with study teams is, you know, obviously you talk about innovation and they, oh, they get scared and you say, okay, let's, let's think it this way. What is the risk if you do nothing? Mm-hmm. That's the bigger risk, right? So if your study, you're not going to change anything, that's the biggest risk. Now, to your point, Josh, uh, I also tell them, I can assure you that what I'm telling you is going to happen is not going to happen, right? I'm sure that this device is not going to work in all patients. Patients are going to get flustered, et cetera. But the key thing is let's start small and let's learn fast, okay? So if it doesn't work, we're going to call tech support right away. We're going to learn what happened, et cetera, and we're going to notify the users. So then we're learning. So let's fail f- small, hopefully, and fast, and we're going to learn. So that's, from my perspective, again, that's something that puts them at ease a little bit, uh, and it, it has worked for, uh, for me at least. I, I think that makes sense. Hey, we're, we're, we're almost at the top of the hour here, and there's one maybe last question that I'll take from the audience, and then... Um, uh, and then I'll open up for my final question for you guys. Um, just from your experiences, are there certain demographics of patient population that will predict where a virtual trial will work? You know, I think maybe there's been a lot of misconceptions around um, age, uh, for one, to, to say that mm-hmm. perhaps um, an older population would be less receptive to the use of technology. But I think that that barrier is being shown to be broken down um, everywhere you turn. You know, the, the comfort level that we see with um, older adults using tablets and, and um, being familiar with it, you know, it's part of, it's been woven into the fabric of society so much that, you know, digital devices um, are, are such the norm that I don't, I don't know that, um, that, 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 old myth uh, still exists. So I think that's one example where you can see that there was a strong perception that it would not be very welcome. And there's, there's just plenty of experiential evidence right now that's a, that really points to a totally much better outcome. So here's my last question for all of you. And uh, Louis, I see you coming on, which is the sign for us to finish. And this has uh, been such a great discussion and I've learned definitely. so much from my colleagues, but let me just ask them if it's okay with you one last question. Um, So here's the question for all of you, and we can go around the circle and give your view. So by the year 2022, a couple years from now, what percentage of new trials do you think will include elements of virtual trials? Rodrigo, let's start with you. Uh, Sure, thank you. Uh, I would say, you know, within clinical trials, we consider from phase one to phase four, right? And phase four is usually where I go because they are less complex. But I would say easily, easily more than 50%, easily, right? I can even go to 75%. And again, that doesn't mean 100% virtual. No, that means that they are applying decentralized components as they should be and make sense. It should be two years easily. I will, I will go 50 to 75%. For new studies, excellent. Kai? Yeah, I would hope that uh, 100% would have a plan uh, for dealing with a situation like this. Uh, but maybe if I have to come up with a number, maybe maybe 60%. Um, I mean, phase one studies are often a difficult use case, uh, but I see even some of those uh, adopting many of these capabilities as well. So I, w- I would go maybe with 60%. Excellent. Angela? Yeah, I don't think I would um, go far off of the metrics that the other panelists have shown. Um, I do think that we're already using certain elements like ECOA very, very broadly on probably 75% of trials or more. So if we want to talk about it from an elemental perspective, I think we're kind of there in certain aspects. But to see second and third and fourth elements being added, I would give it a good 50, uh, 60 to 65% or more. That's really interesting. So on average, somewhere between 50 to 7%. Hey, listen, uh, you guys are experts in your fields. 
and and they're so uh, full of knowledge and experiences. I've learned a lot today. So thank you uh, for this great panel. Yeah, thank um, you. Louis, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Josh, Kai, Angela, Rodrigo. That was amazing. Um, as we are strapped for time, the roundtable discussions are going to be kicking off now. And I think some of you are facilitators as well. So um, if you can, please, for the attendees, thank you for joining. Um, the facilitators will be sticking around and there's going to be a lot more conversations in regards to decentralized trials, risk-based monitoring, virtual trials, patient centricity, and much, much more. So um, please feel free to check your calendars. You should have your uh, Zoom links to go and join your uh, virtual roundtable discussions. And please do not also forget to check out Brella, where we've got the uh, partnering and connections uh, platform. So if you'd like to continue any private discussions, there's a link in the chat there so you can go and uh, connect with your fellow peers. But apart from that, thank you, everyone. And please have a great day and enjoy the virtual experience. Take care. Bye-bye.